Cool. How's everyone doing? My name is Angelo Baca. I am the founder and creative director of Awake New York. This is the business of hype. And today I'm here with Kevin and Lucas, the creative force behind Mischief. Um, how you guys doing? Doing well, doing well. All right. All right. Do you mind uh, Do you mind taking a, a, a second to introduce yourselves and letting us know what you do and how you do it? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. So, hey, I'm Kevin. I'm Lucas. Yeah. Uh, we are two members of Mischief, um, and I guess we're the creative directors or whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, Mischief is very hard to describe quickly like this, um, but we make a lot of things that have sort of nothing to do with each other in terms of physically what they are, whether that's shoes or apps or video games or books. Um, and I think taken in the aggregate, kind of you'll get a sense of the, the the sense of humor that runs through those things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that's very vague, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, maybe simpler version is it's, it's a collective art practice that we've been working towards and building for the past couple of years. Yeah, that's better. Just a split oh. second to introduce yourself, oh, yeah. Kevin. I don't, I don't want to get- My yeah. name's Lucas. Lucas. I'm with Kevin, the other uh, creative director at Mischief and one of a number. One of the members of the collective behind yeah. Mischief. Sick. Um, now, uh, you started kind of uh, describing what Mischief is, and we had a small conversation about it before we started the podcast. But if each one of you can take a, a split second to, yeah, let let the listener, viewer kind of have an idea of what your take of Mischief is. Kevin. Sure. Um, let's see. So we, we, we were talking about this a little bit. I think that one very useful lens to look at mischief is as a performance art practice. Um, and we are making oftentimes kind of like scenarios for the world that then get played out by large groups of people. Um, so I'll give an example. This is a sort of one of our favorite projects recently is, is something called key for all uh we got this pt cruiser 2004 wood paneling absolute shit fox beautiful beautiful car <laughs> beautiful car um, yeah <laughs> and you know it's got the old rfa id unlock kind of key you hit a button the car goes beep beep and the door opens you can get in you can drive it uh turns out if you just duplicate the frequency into a lot of keys there's no upper limit to how many keys can unlock and drive the same car so we had made five thousand keys for this car which we then sold to people in all 50 states uh, and we dumped the car under the BQE uh, and it now belonged to the crowd, right? There's this, uh -huh. this 5,000 person strong army of, of key holders who have access to this car. Basically what we did is we rebuilt Zipcar if they only had one car. Um, <laughs> and this is the kind of thing where internally we had to make peace with the idea that someone could drive it into a ditch in 24 hours and, yeah, and that project first, would be over. Yeah, the first day we released it, we thought it was going to be stripped for parts. But what but, it is, is it's kind of like, it is a setup that is now incumbent on those 5,000 people plus anyone else who happens to be watching to execute on. Mm -hmm. um, and as it turns out, that car went from New York, went across the entire country to California, like tooled around the Southwest in Vegas for a while, ran for about nine months before the engine ultimately burned out but in these cycles of people trying to steal it people trying to liberate it people breaking it people repairing it um and it becomes this kind of like it is this mediated performance art it's almost like a a something in between a play and a reality tv show where we are not delivering a script necessarily but we're delivering a scene and a set of props mm -hmm. um and it becomes almost like a social experiment and, and we right. get to sort of see how that plays out your take yeah yeah i mean my my take is um i mean for me mischief has been an art practice um that has been very obsessed with creating the room for us to have as much creative freedom as possible um internally and then 
externally, I, I also do see it very much as a, uh, I, I do think performance art is probably the best way to put it. It, it sort of maybe more broadly positions all the projects um, with a particular viewpoint. Um, and it, it's interesting because other people I think look at Mischief and they all have different perspectives. They're like, it's a brand, it's an art group, it's a, it's a startup, it's a, they, they almost don't know exactly how to, um, how to pin it. Um, and I think that was when we were starting very clearly something we were trying to go for. We didn't want to be able to be pinned down um, for one thing because we always thought the moment we're pinned down and have to do one thing and people know you only for this one object, you're just going to have to keep doing that. And then you lose that, uh, that ability to be creative and free with right. all the subsequent work. Right. Well, yeah, what, I, what I'm hearing, uh, just to echo a little bit, is just talk about, I mean, basically creative freedom. Yeah. Right. And and um, another small conversation we were having prior to this was, you know, our our education background. And mm -hmm. um, both of you guys met at RISD. Yeah. Um, yeah. So starting at RISD and where you're at now, you know, did you think this is what you're going to be doing for a living? Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, and, 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 maybe, well, and actually, I don't mean to interrupt, yeah, yeah. but I think also just for context, it'd be interesting for the listeners to know where, what you studied in school. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I mean, so I studied furniture design. I studied industrial design. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we were both in those departments um, trying to make art stuff um, and thought that it was... Like design is such a good category for art making because it um, it can reach many more people than sort of general gallery world. Um, also, art. I mean, you know, you studied furniture design. I studied what is, you know, usually product design. Uh, by the end of the time that we were in school, we were making nothing but websites, right? Yeah. Like, yeah it's a little yeah, misleading, yeah. that that setup. Yeah. Um, but I think even at that time, like, mm -hmm. So I, part of the context here is, you know, Mischief began as, as a group of whatever, however, five or six people, depends sort of how you count the exact start date. Um, Lucas and I worked together, obviously, for a long time before that, basically mm -hmm. since the day we met in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, several of the other founding guys uh, had worked together themselves previously before that. Um, but um, for us, at least, sort of coming from this more traditional arts background. One of the things we were interested in very, very early on was this idea of going out and getting to an audience, because I think it was very apparent that, you know, we saw people making sculptures, paintings, or things much more experimental than that, but they ended up living in kind of like your traditional gallery type ecosystems, or they aspired to live in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it was, very limiting, both in terms of just the number of people who would ever see something. And also it was kind of like, that's one audience and you hit that same audience again and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we became interested in kind of like the, basically like the mechanics of scale as a force multiplier for whatever concept we were, we were mm -hmm. trying to work on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt like there were a lot of people making incredibly good work and it felt like it was just um, just sitting stagnant in, you know, the gallery space or in the uh, in that school um, environment and not ever pushing outside of there. So I, when we were in school, we were very much trying to make things that spread as much as possible. Mm. Um, yeah. So we're here to, to talk about the collective but the more i get to know you and hear you both it, it feels like a duo right and and i'm kind of curious because I, I i have um a best friend that i met at sva and he's the only friend i made and he's still my best friend who i love dearly shout out rafael rios <laughs> um, <laughs> we met in alternative lighting techniques i still remember the day i met him give me a little back like what, what what was the sun like what song was playing when you guys met one another because you know it's a relationship you know it's a it's a it's, it's a many forms of a relationship but i'm just kind of curious to see like what what it was like when you guys met one another or what drew you to each other oh, good i mean hmm. yeah i'm trying to think what, what was the first i remember we were we were living in the same like uh dorm 
scenario. I think I was probably like sleeping on a couch or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we can give some anecdotes, right? Like, yeah. uh, Lucas was a was a an accomplished cellist in a former life. He brought his cello to college with him. Okay. And for some reason, he decided that the well. Maybe the only place you had space for it was to store the cello on your bed, oh, which meant you couldn't sleep. Nice. So yeah, you're just yeah, like yeah. sleeping just, on the floor yeah, for projected yeah, periods yeah. of time. Yeah, we had like very <laughs> tiny box room. That, yeah. But but okay. So one thing I do want to just sort of not push back on, but I want to clarify a little bit because I think, and this is one of the reasons that mischief very rarely sort of puts face to camera in this way, mm -hmm. is you're getting a lot of our personalities yeah. and that's going to be ultimately misleading if you assume that that is what mischief the group is mm -hmm. um because in, in a lot of ways part of the project of mischief is consciously that it is the organization mm -hmm. that is the sort of like the author entity behind what we're doing and that really is a melting pot of a lot of different things so if mm -hmm. we're just uh I mean, if it were just Lucas and I, basically mischief would not exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I I think that sort of, it's one of the things that also becomes very confusing in a setting like mm -hmm. this, because I can tell you all about our path to where we are, but that's mm -hmm. not at all the entire story because what mischief sort of is, is this structure that enables creative work. And the only way it's able to do that is mm -hmm. because it has not just from us, honestly, from everyone, like a huge amount of just creative energy bubbling around, but it also has kind of like technical proficiency and organizational mm -hmm. finesse that let us achieve things at mm -hmm. a scale that's dramatically larger. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would even go so far as to say, like, we tried some things similarly beforehand that were complete fails in some sense. Oh, totally. Yeah. And and without everybody, I think it's sort of, it. it, it is, you're right, like it is the the both the friction and the different perspectives at Mischief that sort of bring a lot of these projects to light in a way that they would not exist purely in an art space or purely in um, more maybe more of a space. commercial space, yeah. Well, the, the reason, well, by default, I focus on the two of y'all because you're here. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, So yeah. Let's, let, let's, let's get that clear. I, in no way am I trying to credit the two of y'all to the success of Mischief because my former job was the same thing. I was I was one part of the puzzle, mm -hmm. right? And essentially, I was part of a team, right? But before I got to point Z, I had to go through everything else, right? So that's why I, what I find mm -hmm. interesting is because maybe there's definitely some kid at RISD or SVA that might not really, let's say, maybe undervalue that friend that they have to realize like if you tap in like what you have right in front of you, mm -hmm. you just don't know where that's gonna take you, right? So like. You guys went, you know, as individuals, A, then B, coming together, and then C, eventually joining Mischief. So, yeah, I mean, one one thing I do have to say about that is 100%. I believe there's a, there's like a big, especially in art school, big emphasis on the individual. It's it's mm -hmm. all like you make your stuff, I make my stuff. Maybe we come together, we talk about it. But I actually think there's a lot of power in working together and collaboratively and and honestly when we were in college that was what we were doing it was always about making things with friends but i felt like oftentimes people didn't look at it in um as positive a way where like maybe it's just the individual work that um that you wanted to focus on but i i think you can you can supersize your impact working with people also it's much more fun yeah i just gotta yeah, say yeah, it's like much yeah. more you know you keep me going is same with everybody else at mischief like just in terms of like constantly trying to um keep the keep that energy up also if we're, i mean okay if we're gonna rant about art school i can do an extended <laughs> bit here yeah, so yeah, yeah. especially when we were in school i think there was a lot of emphasis on this idea that like oh arts people should be paying attention to business and the way that that manifested was like you know, you had a bunch of you had a bunch of design kids who would sit down and like do the financial accounting module <sighs> from HBS's free online course materials, where it was like some uh, professor would lecture about like you need to make yourself a website because you are a brand, you know, blah 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 blah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and part of this is because you're in art school, right? Everybody is like, oh, like business. Who wants to think about that? Ugh, gross, you know. 
why would I ever sacrifice any creative freedom to a business decision? Um, and it was, again, about the individual. It was like, you, the artist, are going to learn a little bit about these other skill sets. And that's going to, you know, turn you into some kind of um, superhero. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that for us, or at least I, I can say, the that all goes out the window immediately when you work with a business guy who's good and understands what the two of you are working on together. Um, and so when we talk about like what it means to work with people, it's not just the idea of like creative person A like glues themselves to creative person B, maybe glues themselves to creative person C and you get like, you know. Like different skill sets are important. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and it is the skill sets that are not strictly in that creative space that really are the amplifier for what you can do, I think. And it, or at least that's what's often overlooked when arts education talks about sort of like collaboration and, and sort of what it means to assemble um, a team to work on something. It's you, you specifically want someone who is really good on you know, technical p capacity, whatever, um, because it's always going to be so much, so much more sort of like generative than, than thinking that you have to learn just a little bit of everything yourself and try to compile it all into, into one discipline. So, um, if you can, um, I guess give us some insight when, you made a decision to go from the duo to the collective. Why, you know, why did you decide? Because I'm not familiar with the rest of the collective and mischief, but you saw these other four to six individuals and you're like, this is it. You know, like this is what we've been missing. Because you mentioned a few seconds ago how you tried something doing, doing something together as the two of y'all. And then we're like, wait, we need to link up with these guys. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like everybody at the initial outset and still today from Mischief, um, everybody individually, I think, had made stuff online that um, was very creative and they understood how to make things s spread. I felt like we had a very, we realized pretty early on that we had a good team um, of complementary skill sets to some extent. I think the actually the the creative the idea generating thing i think um comes from all of us but i think our internally like there were some people that were just very strong developers or very strong product designers or very strong at understanding how to get things to spread online um and i think all those i think very early on we just realized that so many complementary skill sets that you know we didn't have i mean we're just we were just assembling um filling all the gaps that we were missing to some right, extent right. yeah i mean the core group of us got introduced by people who had seen the work that each of us was doing and i think independently both to us and to the other guys had said like hey you should meet these people because i think you'll really like what they're working on yeah i mean um, it's funny because i feel like early on i even they were thinking that maybe we were competitors to them right not right, realizing right. Yeah, that we yeah, were yeah, just yeah, yeah. yeah. We were uh, existing or, in such different spaces yeah but, um but and then yeah it really was just like we did not start by saying oh let's all sit down and start something together we started just sort of like working loosely working yeah. next to and around each other um and it quickly became apparent, I think, just on a gut feeling level that we knew we were really going to click. Um, and from there, from there, then it became, you know, all right, let's see what happens if, and really this was like the core handful of tenets for Mischief was just, we are going to make something every two weeks, no matter what. <laughs> even if it sucked, we had to put it out. Like, even if it was, and we... Yeah. And we are only going to make things that we all really want to make. And let's yeah. see what happens. Yeah. And what does that process look like? What does that collaborative process look like? You're trying to pump something out every two weeks. Like, a, what's the seed? 
that starts that process. Uh, right. I mean, I, I think the seed initially is just a lot of idea generation. I think we have, you know, thousands and thousands of unrealized um, ideas and concepts that we've come up with uh, over the years now. Um, and most but, of them are terrible. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but I think it's sort of like, then it becomes a question of, like, if these are some ideas that we all agree are good, is it is it a feasible idea? Is it an idea that we can achieve at this time and this stage of mischief? And um, then if those two things are agreed upon, we're like, okay, let's go ahead and let's try it. Um, there are definitely ideas that we've had in the past that were just not feasible at certain points in time. But then as we got bigger, it became more feasible that we've, um, you know, worked on or realized. But I think the core is just thousands and thousands of ideas. Um, I'm just trying to build a practice around that. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, so <laughs> when we talk about, when we talk about mischief using the word collective, I think it's, it, it's a funny word because it, it's sort of one of those things that somebody started calling us that because it's really hard to describe mischief <laughs> in a short number of words and uh -huh. it kind of stuck. Um, but the place where I think mischief really bears out that word is in this idea generation process. Like that is the thing that is the backbone of our operations week over week across everybody who's part of mischief mm -hmm. is we sit down and we generate a bunch of ideas, right? That's that's like the clock tick. That's the whatever, the minute hand, the second hand. <laughs> uh, and from those ideas, some of them go into production, you know, a few months later, some of them go into production a few years later. Um, one thing that we absolutely don't do that sometimes people think when we say we release oh, something yeah, every two yeah, weeks, yeah. they think that we make everything in two weeks. We, which mm. is always crazy uh, to me. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. nuts. That's generally projects are like a year out at this point in time. Right. So like we're working on things, yeah. if not longer. So it's always shocking to me when someone says, "Oh yeah, you guys made that in two weeks," and we're like, "No, no, no, <laughs> this has been in the the works like for a is long a, time." Is a full on product that we cut tooling for. There is no way we made this in two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's also like one of the one of the other nice things about working on those those long timelines and with this huge bank of ideas is sort of like for us, there's, there is a test of time element that's very important. Um, if we are, we, if we are not still interested in something mm -hmm. two months down the line, it was not, then it was not a good enough idea. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. God we didn't start working on it sooner. Yeah. I mean, actually one thing I feel like we do very consciously is not make things that are reactive to um, the, you know, the grind of the social media feed. Like, I think everything we make is is something that we are genuinely interested in and hope we're interested in for like a two or three year period at the very least. I think a lot of, yeah, a lot of creatives, I've, right now I think they're really, really tethered to making things that keep up with the pace of, um, you know, constantly reacting to whatever the trending thing is mm -hmm. in the feed. And I feel like that is just a recipe for burnout and just long term, um, you know, long term, you just end up getting gobbled up by, you know, just regurgitating everything everybody else is making and not actually making new things. Um, well, I think that's that's um, it's exercising self-discipline, right? Mm -hmm. When obviously the bills need to be paid. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where it's even even more so important to have like-minded people, creatives around you, and also the business people that you talk about. Usually, mm -hmm. business people are the ones that want to push you to like, hey, do the thing again, right? Like, do the red boot again. Yeah, you, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, we could cash out on it, but mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of hard to show the self-discipline to not. And um, just to go off on on a small tangent, but um, you know, like I said, just talking to you guys briefly before uh, the podcast and now, you know, um, both of you come across very lighthearted, you know, not so serious, you know what I mean? Um, and it seems like that's kind of like, and like something that's maybe like a new practice in artists and the way they're building themselves and building the brands of, of kind of having this kind of satirical take on the work. Um, and I, I feel in, in my humble opinion, you guys have been at the forefront of that 
Um, and that's why, you know, I, I don't see mischief as streetwear, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, like we were talking about that also, like how to me mischief is, is more an, an art project. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense even hearing more that you're from RISD. Uh, I guess the whole point that I'm trying to make is why do you think that's, that's happening? First, why was that your approach? And correct me if I'm wrong, you mm -hmm. know? And second, you know, it seems like that's kind of has had a ripple effect mm -hmm. um, in fashion and then also in traditional art. Yeah, yeah. I mean, f for me, I think humor is one of the best tools that you can use to get people to engage with subject matter that if it was presented in an extremely serious way, they would be afraid of right. engaging with it. So I think oftentimes, I think it helps disarm a concept to an extent mm. and um, helps position it in a way that lets many more people engage with it. Um, so I feel like throughout all of the work, there is definitely a through line of 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 humor um but I, I i think it's humor is sometimes just like a super powerful tool to just help um help make concepts more digestible you know i don't know if you're yeah yeah i mean i think that's true also i mean there there is some level to which it's it is just the style of work that we like to do but mm -hmm. i i think absurdism is another mm. word that isn't very good through line for a lot of mischief's work and some of that is we used to talk about this idea that there's sort of there's no sense of future in culture at this moment in time mm -hmm. um and i think this was well articulated a few years ago but um it, there's sort of this this idea that what we're doing is it's not the future as much as it is sort of like the absurd intensification of the present mm -hmm. moment which lends itself to mm -hmm becoming ridiculous um yeah, it's like if you took the dynamics of things happening right now and just supersized them you know 20 percent yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i think there's an idea making. that this is, this is what is happening in culture right now anyway right. it is not progressing it is sort of spiraling more concentratedly in on itself mm -hmm. um we we talk about the the spicy present the, yeah the spicy present for this yeah. internally did you did you ever think that um this uh it almost feels like this inside joke would be taken seriously and applied to mainstream culture uh, i mean i think this is us describing mainstream <laughs> culture yeah 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 <laughs> yeah yeah i don't even know if it's inside i don't know joke. if it's an inside joke yeah i think it's just sort of in some sense, we are just reflecting back our time, or, okay. um, but just turning it up slightly. Okay. Um, I hate to sound cheesy, but this is I, some of these questions I wrote, and some of these like, I'm kind of freestyling. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. <laughs> uh, what's, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? Whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> Another tangent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah good question I, this is giving me flashbacks because i i'm yeah. pretty sure this was the question on my common app college admissions essay oh very <laughs> funny. Yeah, yeah. i think john wrote it john one of the producers for the yeah, show yeah. he was on that uh that committee that oh wrote that yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> um I, I feel like the best advice is that making things is really hard mm -hmm. and i think sometimes like for me the the advice i would give people maybe i haven't heard it necessarily is just freaking just make it just do mm -hmm. it put it out there and honestly it's i feel like we, we've been talking about art school a lot i feel like it's very easy to make things in that environment and then once you get out you realize like holy shit it's so hard to make stuff in the real world it's just from you know, a facility perspective, from a financial perspective. And I, I feel like I, I, the first level of, of just doing anything is just making it and getting it out there. And that right. might be kind of like a cheesy thing to say, but um, I honestly, I applaud anybody that makes an object and put, pushes it out into the world. And then after that, we can start, you know, getting into it critique wise. But I, I think that first hump is honestly so much harder than you think. And I think a lot of creative people are very precious about yeah. the work that they're making and want to hold it on, hold on to it. And I think even from our previous practice before Mischief, um, 
I think we were much more precious about work and it held things back. But honestly, the mischief thing of every two weeks, we have to put something out, like took a little bit of that preciousness away that I think was incredibly helpful for continuing to have a creative practice that develops and, and, and pushes out. So I would just say, just make stuff, put it out there, then make more stuff and keep putting it out there. Um, I wish someone just told me that like right from the beginning. I, I feel like uh, at least for me, COVID enabled me to lean into that mm -hmm. and not um, subscribe to the fear right because mm -hmm. nobody likes to be criticized you know like you would hope everything you make is cool and it's the best shit ever yeah, yeah but the yeah. reality is like at least for me like eight times out of ten is going to be kind of whack right you no know? no yeah. completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> um uh but I, I definitely wouldn't have been able to get to where i'm at without having like once again having that right person to ask kind of like um kind of have like a soundboard you know mm -hmm. basically have a mentor so like who, who were the mentors that you had that kind of helped you push the idea and release some of that fear mm good good question i mean to be honest i think this it goes back to each of us independently i think we were pretty good yeah, like friend yeah. group just pushing things out at the beginning um but i don't know i mean good question it's it's tough yeah. to answer this question also for a group right like yeah oh you can answer as an individual yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. sure 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 i mean i think um Honestly, not to just go back to school stuff, but just the, <laughs> for us, I think it was really useful to have um, people uh, who would basically give us uh, course credit for doing our own work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and sort of this idea that, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was it was great to have institutional support for the idea that kind of subverting a system to work for the things you wanted to make was good in a way. I mean, I, I, again, talking this idea that, you know, we're, we're both basically studying some version of product design. We're making websites, we're making images, we're not really making anything physical. Um, and I think we were very lucky to have people who help us basically uh, figure out how to make the institutional structure around us like support just kind of freestyling our way through mm -hmm. um yeah. that that academic yeah. environment and then also also honestly immediately after school we had we were put into uh we were part of a program at the new museum which was sort of a combination of a art and technology uh space called new ink which was a really great environment um to sort of continue that practice um, outside of the school environment. It was also, I mean, it was great to be in a spot next to a lot of people who were all in various stages of developing sort of their own practices from, mm -hmm. you know, things just starting out to like, uh, like Telfart was operating out of that space for yes. a minute, right? So yeah. it was like side by side, we could see a lot of different stages of creative practices at once which yeah, is yeah, which is that. really very valuable mm -hmm. um like us just starting out versus them being already sort of right right you know however many person yeah. operations at that point um mm -hmm. there's something that COVID makes much more challenging honestly yeah yeah but it was very insightful and and inspiring but also just like really practically useful to be able to talk to people who had said like oh you're trying to do mm -hmm. whatever i remember the first we had a the first time we ever had a client in china they asked us for some incredibly obscure <laughs> like financial receipt type document um and there happened to be another group in this space who like their whole deal was coordinating artist residencies in China. And we were like, help, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what does this word even mean? <laughs> like, you know, we're, we're like on Chinese government websites and they're like, oh, you have to order the special printer that only the government can sell you that only prints this one type of receipt. Uh, just being around people who, who have experience in weird niche situations was, was so valuable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kevin, this question is for you. Um, any words of advice for, you know, the younger version of you trying to come up in, in this visual art game? 
um well okay so specifically for the younger version of me i think i would say that uh personal technical skill is uh not a uh not a single game winning strategy Mm. um which you Although know, I think it, it helps quite a bit. Oh, it helps. Yeah, it's oh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Good, good to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to have. Um, but if I could get like earlier versions of me to relying on other members of a team sooner, I would. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that that's a good point. But yeah, learning how to draw is really important. I think if okay. you want to be in the that is actually learning, learning how to draw. I think literally, <laughs> literally knowing how to pen to paper drawing. Yeah. what you envision is like super. The best way of communicating things. Ridiculously important. Also being able to do it fast on the spot. Yeah. Probably the most important skill that I have from art school. I, I, same, same. Well, I feel good. How do y'all feel? <laughs> good, good, good. I feel like we got a, a, a fair kind of like visibility uh, on the characters of Kevin and Luca. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, any parting words? Well, I mean, thank you for having us. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, likewise. yeah, yeah. It's been a been an interesting. Uh, trip yeah, yeah, down yeah. I told you I was going to be harmless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be good. So, uh, shout out to Bullet. Shout out to Hype Beast. Um, this is Angelo Bacche. All right, later, y'all. Peace. This season of Business of Hype is brought to you by Bullet Frontier Whiskey. Mentorship is a key to artistic growth. A crucial relationship for any budding artist or creator that's looking for solutions to navigate their industry. The problem is, how do we find it? As part of their commitment to support the creators on the frontier of culture, Bullet has committed to providing mentorship resources to those breaking new ground across art, sustainability, food, cocktails, and mixology, and technology. It's called the Bullet Pioneer Project a multi-year commitment that pairs mentors with mentees from all over the globe to open the doors for knowledge sharing, learning, and collaboration. Today, we're talking with Sira, a multidisciplinary artist out of NYC and her mentor, Ebony Ward, CEO of the management firm Eleventh and Co. Aye, right, yo, let's get into it. Hi, my name is Angelo Bacche. I am the creative director and founder of Awake New York, and today I am blessed to be in the presence of Ebony Ward and Sira. Um, hi. Hey. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> For the audience, do you mind introducing yourselves and uh, telling us the part that you've played in the Bullet Pioneer Project? Sira? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm Sira. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I focus within music and film as well as like spray painting a bit. Um, and I am the mentee artist. The Minty, yes. <laughs> My name is Ebony Ward. I am the owner of Eleventh and Co., which is a full service management company. Um, and I am the mentor of the program. The mentor. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah. I, I mean, not to go off on a tangent, but I'm, I'm blessed to be in the presence of, oh, of two yeah. amazing uh, talents and creatives like yourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not as young as you anymore, Sierra. <laughs> But um, if you don't mind uh, sharing with us uh, the challenges that you face as a young artist in this music industry specifically. Yeah, I mean, I think for myself, because I do a number of things that sometimes can be the biggest complication and that it's not the most easily digestible thing to say that I I do music, I do video, I do fine art in that kind of context. Um, And so trying to balance these ranges of spaces um, sometimes can be difficult. But I think within music specifically, um, having more like women-led environments would definitely change the game. Mm. I think just as a woman navigating in male-dominated spaces overall is always difficult no matter what. Um, but especially within music, because there's professionalism, all those things, sometimes those lines can be very like blurred. Mm. Um, and I love being within like safer spaces and spaces that I feel most comfortable in. So that's where I've just been trying to be in like when I trust people um, and feel a good energy within them like I feel with Ebony like I feel with you as well um, those are the most rewarding music industry spaces I feel like I've been in 
Mm -hmm. Ebony, uh, you play an important role in this relationship as the mentor. What has the role of mentorship played in your trajectory and in, in your narrative uh, coming up in this industry? Um, it's, it's a very important role only because I take it so seriously. Um, I think that being a woman, especially in this business, um, we're the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. you know, we're like the safeguards. So being like, it's an honor even for to be chosen or to even be sought after to be in a position like this, because I understand how important it is. I understand because I also had a mentor who was able to guide and to lead me through the music business. Um, and sometimes if we don't have that, the right mentorship, we can become lost. Mm. So Sierra, what, what, um, what is the long-term plan or goal that you have for this relationship that you're starting to have now with Ebony? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing is being able to have these conversations and advice in terms of what next steps kind of look like, especially in an ever changing kind of environment like the music industry. I think what's great about Ebony is just a unique individual is that it seems as if she's always thinking ahead, um, which is helpful to be able to plan and understand what each next steps could look like. Um, but also just someone who's been in the game for so much longer than I have. Um, and I think Ebony is also like a, a jack of all trades in her understanding her background, the type of work that she's been involved with in, in multiple lanes and spaces. I think, especially me as a multidisciplinary, that's really great because it feels like she can understand music and visual and fashion. Mm. Um, so I, I would love to have that be further cultivated. Um, but I think the biggest thing is being able to get advice and have this person I can talk to. And um, that alone is, is the biggest blessing. Mm. I love that you you brought up jack of all trades because mm -hmm. I feel like we're all jacks of all trades. <laughs> yeah. And I'll see I'll speak for myself, master of none, mm -hmm. uh, constantly just juggling all the hats. Mm -hmm. um, during this relationship with Ebony, which is the one skill set that you gravitate towards that you see that Ebony has that I'm not saying that you don't have it, mm -hmm. but it's something you feel like you know how steel sharpens steel mm -hmm. that that you see something that w that's within her that you naturally gravitated towards. I think the understanding and how to build and cultivate community in multiple lanes and spaces. I think for me, I appreciate community so much, IRL, but I think even in intro kind of conversations, I feel like Ebony already had a good understanding of how to build that even further through social, through aspects that aren't just face to face. How can you showcase yourself, market yourself beyond that? Um, and that's definitely something I feel like I could absolutely use um, advice and help in and off the gate she's definitely had that knowledge yeah right no i know she's only what two years younger than you <laughs> but, <laughs> really <laughs> but what do you see in sierra that you gravitate towards um in your mentee as the mentor i mean i see so much of myself in her um, not only because she's a Virgo and I'm a Virgo, <laughs> yeah. we're okay. the best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but shout aside, out to the Virgos. You know, which may, shout out to the Virgos. <laughs> um, but aside from that is her being, so there are so many layers of her, mm -hmm. right? Um, just as there are with me. And I think that that's what I see most in her because she's like a reflection of me in that way. Um, and we can be really hard to understand, right? So when you work in a space and you're working with someone who to the outside world seems so all over the place, it's like, mm -hmm. we know how to navigate in chaos, which is very, which is very rare, right? And that's challenging for people to be receptive of. Mm -hmm. But because I've experienced the same thing, I can kind of help guide and aid her mm -hmm. on how to approach um, different, not only business circumstances, mm -hmm. but just like life circumstances right. as a whole. Um, now, now that you've had this relationship with Sierra, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not familiar if this is your first mentor mentee uh, relationship, but um, what is it that you're walking away from this relationship that you'll take on in the future with, let's say, like the next era, you know, like what 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 words of wisdom do you have for like this next generation coming up in, in the industry specifically for young women? Um, specifically, I mean, Sierra is she's not my first. This is, but also like I look at every mentorship very differently because everybody has different needs. Mm. Um, but more than anything, I would say to the next generation is just be open minded, be willing to learn. 
and willing to listen, right? I think as creators, we have, they can live by like an I know, I know attitude mm -hmm. because they know what they want. They have a vision for themselves. Um, they don't, you know, a lot of the younger generation, they don't like to be challenged in that way. But my biggest advice would just be open, just be open to listen and to digest information and to know that it's coming from a genuine place. And, you know, with age definitely comes experience, mm. you know, even though I'm only two years old. <laughs> 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 but I have yeah. a lot of knowledge and, you right. know, I just want to make her journey less stressful if in any way possible and right. at any capacity. So I'm quite sure that this is going to be a growing relationship and I look forward to continue building and watching her blossom and grow. Yeah. yeah, I'm not trying to speak for you. I'm not trying to mansplain anything <laughs> about it. But I think the key word is to receive. Because yeah. I think that wasn't the easiest thing for me to do when I was younger. And I'd be like, what's his old head talking like, exactly. about? You know, I know I know what I'm doing. I don't I got this, you know, I'm here. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, humility plays a big part as you grow mm -hmm. as a creative in, in any industry. But, you know, Sierra, now that you've had this relationship with, with Ebony, you know, uh, what are your future plans now that you're starting to receive this skill set? And um, I guess, how do you, how do you plan on paying it forward? Mm. That's a good question. I think, well, for me, I work at the Schoenberg currently. So I, I work mm. with youth development and, and youth programs. And a part of that is within mixing art and history and culture. And so I feel like I have had to be in positions with the little littles and, and mentorship type roles. Um, but I think from this now I have a whole other leg of information and knowledge that I can also come back and uh, filter within that space and offer more of like, especially young, young kids who are mainly in like high school teenagers um, with this information so that they have it their way ahead of the way ahead of the, the rest of their peers. So I think that's how I probably want to like pay it forward and, and push it within that space. And we've already had a few conversations about <laughs> where we could see that. But I think the biggest thing also I'm ex just excited about is like, I actually think it's comforting to be able to have spaces where you say you don't know. Cause mm. I think a lot of times that also comes from feeling like you have to <sighs> kind of like put on a front, like everything is solid. I know everything, I get the vision um, so that people can like believe in you. And that's, that's valid in certain contexts, but it feels really good to have soft landing spaces where you can feel comfortable to be vulnerable to say, I, I really actually don't know. I need your wisdom. So I, I think for, for me, that will be a really great um, space to have within this, and especially again, someone as knowledgeable as Ebony. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. You, you know, uh, the word that I gravitate towards that you just said is vulnerability, and mm -hmm. us being native New Yorkers, like vulnerability yeah. means like you saw, like I ain't saw, <laughs> yeah. I ain't no punk, exactly. you know, vulnerability. <laughs> I ain't showing no vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, but no, that that's beautiful, and, and I think yeah, that, that's probably one of the biggest lessons, even for me as the as the being in the mentor role mm -hmm. to allow myself to to get honest with the youth that I'm I'm able to help and, and open up and you know because it's not always perfect you know it, it, and it's it's not always going to be victories every day so it's it's also good to share like the hardships and yeah. when things aren't so easy mm -hmm. you know um so I mean is there any parting words that you like to have uh, Ebony uh, any Where's sage words? Where's the wisdom? <laughs> you know, like, how, you know, how do I get to be the next Ebony? You know, I mean, nobody can be the next Ebony. The only Facts. thing that people can be is themselves, <laughs> right? Yes. There is greatness in all of us, um, but in together we can do so much more. So, I mean, that that's all I got. Okay, that's all I got today. Yes. Sierra, <laughs> uh, I'd say, don't be afraid to do all the things that you love. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in this position partially because I am multidisciplinary and that feels really rewarding. So I'd say if you love it, do it and make it make sense. <laughs> but yeah, just move with gratitude and mm -hmm. um, and awareness and be present in your moments. And hopefully you'll land in spaces with amazing people. Well, let's, let's give it up to yeah. amazing people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shout out to Bullet. Shout out to Hype Beast. Um, shout out to yourselves. Thanks for tuning in. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. Peace.